So, my name is Laura. Guys, I am here because of, as I already was saying, I've been just as crushed and heartbroken as you. Um, when I was, I really just was finding friendship through Facebook a little bit before the referendum vote and then in the aftermath. And it, it grew to, within like a month, I had 500 new friends from Ireland. And then it's gotten to probably 800 or 900. A lot of a lot of good souls, and we all have the same sentiment. And um, come on in. I, I don't know if she can tippy toe around to the front. Yeah. So. So the so. That's I, I just kept just having this like. You know, throbbing broken heart for you guys, and wanting to come here, and in twofold say. Do everything you can to stop this. No return it. And okay, it's going to be a long battle. And I've been, since I was 24, 25 years old, I've just had my heart broken at my own abortion clinics that I, in my neighborhoods, a couple different places I've lived in recent decades. And I've had to learn how to uh, be kind of tough love and gentle and but stubborn all at, all at the same time, when you're trying to you know, witness to the girls to try to get them to turn around, which has happened. Or also, you spend a lot of time between when clients go into these clinics with the people who, like you must have met, on the yes side of this campaign that you were up against. Nasty people who want to dismiss the rights of the human baby in this situation. And this whole stupid, nomenclature and euphemisms about women's bodies. They have a right to decide the right of life or death of this other human being that's within them. So, I mean, all that nasty stuff that you probably encountered, well, that's a regular thing at every day there's an appointment for abortion outside an abortion clinic when the escorts, we call them death escorts, um, are outside. And, and you, if you either just don't say anything to each other, or if there is a little skirmish, you you know, how do you try to say something that maybe will be a seed in their heart that grows one day, and the truth will come out in their hearts? Because there are people who flip into being pro-life, and that's you know we want that, right? So I wanted to come over and explain just a lot. So first thing I want to say is I'm going to list really fast in about three minutes, a short list of all of the hundreds of pro-life ministries that are pretty much, you know, started in America, and there's so many. Um, you may have heard the, how many of you have heard the March for Life? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's coming up this coming Friday. I've already heard about some Irish are going over to it, um, which is cool, you know. You, it's 500 to 700,000 people um, come, and sometimes we're in snowstorms, um, if, if it gets that weather. Um, usually on the anniversary of the 22nd of March, and we, we just completely uh, occupy downtown Washington and walk to the Supreme Court. We, and usually, not everybody, because it would be hard, but a lot of people go to the um, congressmen and senators' offices. That's what the march was designed for, to walk from the White House to the Su Supreme Court as a protest kind of march or whatever and say this was wrong and then go right around the Supreme Court as capital or U.S. Capitol and go to your U.S. Congressmen and Senators and say vote for life, vote for the Human Life Amendment, let's turn this over, you know, overturn it, whatever it takes. Um, a lot of people don't get that far because they have to get back on their buses and go back home but at least the solidarity, it's, it's really a beautiful thing, it's, it's very uplifting. The National Right to Life um, anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Started by John Wilkie. American Life League, started by Judy Brown. Mm -hmm. um, Human Life International, started yes. by Father Paul Marx. Um, local things that I got involved in are examples of local stuff everywhere. But I was hired by the Delaware County Pro Life Coalition to work in their very first maternity home. So the people that started that. Um, Dr. George Dye and Kathy Call are still my good friends, and I mean, they become your friends for life, you know. Uh, the Pro-Life Union of Southeast Pennsylvania was started by a guy named John Stanton, 
He had 12 kids, and his son Patrick is now running it. John, may he rest in peace, died about five years ago. And I know John, I told Patrick, his, his son, he's my friend, I know your dad would be on the first plane over here if he was still alive to try to help talk and encourage. Um, Good Council Homes is an entity of about seven homes around New York City, New Jersey, uh, Staten Island, started by Chris Bell. It, actually, that book of the prison letters, where is it? Um, because it's, yeah. Christopher Bell married the lady who that book that, who wrote those prison letters. <laughs> yeah, and um, so Students for Life. Anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very good group. Um, Survivors is another group that's like for kids, and anybody really who's younger than born in 1972, three. So anybody who's born after that is considered a survivor. Um, there's Crisis pregnancy centers, there's probably just a round number, at least a dozen in every state. So some of our larger states, like Pennsylvania, where I'm from, probably has a lot more than a dozen. But if you take a dozen times 50, that's 600 crisis pregnancy centers. I mean, they're awesome. They are, they are what holds, you know, the pro-life movement together as far as, you know, walking the walk of helping women. So... The same thing is going on here, of course, with Gianna Care, and there's um, Ask Magella, I think is another organization that's help, helping women, and I think there's some more kind of clandestine ones that I don't know the names of them, but there are definitely ways that women can try to find help when they're in crisis, but I'm telling you, they shouldn't be so clandestine. <laughs> and as part of what I'm here to say is there's got to be some more, less fear of Simon Harris and threats to shut things down and stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> Makes me mad. Um, Operation Rescue. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's what where the Protestants got involved in the idea of the peaceful nonviolent sit-ins and they grew huge. And um, Life Dynamics, anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's a very good organization that seeks to find out where all the faults and failings are of the abortionists, and they, they help to cultivate, bring out lawsuits again, where women unfortunately die from abortions and or have been severely damaged. Um, there's other parts that my, Mark Crutcher founded that did that he's helped on, like the way, have you heard of um, Lila Rose? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, no, mm -hmm. totally, it's Life, what does she call her group? Live Action. Live Action. I think in a way Life Dynamics was a precursor to what Lila Rose does. And Lila Rose is younger and really pretty and <laughs> very good on TV, talking at, on every chance she gets to give. So she's, I think, maybe taken up more attention, but Life, Life Dynamics is, has similar attitude of trying to uncover the grisly side of abortion. Um, Anybody heard of Project Rachel? Pro yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and, Project, and Rachel's Vineyard. Yeah. Yeah. And there's other kinds of ministries like that for post-abortion healing. Um, Priests for Life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joe Scheidler and the Pro-Life yeah. Action mm -hmm. Network of yeah. Chicago. So I've just, that took more than three minutes. But so 40 Days for Life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Helpers of God's Precious yeah. Infants. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, I just was handwriting extra. I realized last night, gosh, there's a whole bunch I didn't really, I could <laughs> probably think of 10 more. But this is what we've been doing in the United States, and you sound like you're all very well versed, and this is how, you know, 45 years, let me think now, I think we're at 46 years, right? This year, unfortunately, marks that. Of, and the people who know the truth about the tragedy of this, they, they can't help themselves. They created all these organizations to, like, say, stop! This is wrong. And we're facing a battle against the devil himself, and it's really hard. And we have to keep having these kinds of groups, you know? We have to keep dying to self and rising up again despite skirmishes amongst each other and just join the next group or, you know, pull together the groups you were in and, and, and try to keep at it. So that's the first thing I want to say. There is a heck of a lot of life, pro-life work going on. And is some of the people I talked to, and like I said, what would you say if I was going to Ireland? And I could say, they were like, you know, I have so much work going on here in the United States. With, there's dead babies here. What's the difference between dead babies here or dead babies there? 
I can't even think going out to other country. They weren't being a little bit serious and cynical. Like, it tired them out mm -hmm. to think about how could they help on one hand. On the other hand, um, they didn't disagree that it's important to encourage. But that's how, I mean, they're very busy. There's all these organizations are very busy. So, let me tell you a little more about my, myself and how I got so very on fire for this issue. The first moment I learned about abortion was at the age of seven and a half. I was at a table with Right to Life literature at, it, at our parish in Beltsville, Maryland, which is just outside Washington, D.C., where I was born. When I asked my mom why there were baby dolls in a black trash bag in one of the pictures, my mom said, those are not dolls. And of course, seven-year-old, why? What are they? What? And I was horrified as she explained that they were real babies and they were dead and thrown away. I looked up to see that my mom had a tear rolling down her face. This was enough for me to realize at age seven that abortion was wrong. And I wanted to say a side note here. This is why graphic pictures are not wrong. There is a time and a place <coughs> to not have them and there's a time and a place to have them. But honestly, a seven-year-old child, it's an inoculation. I would never have thought of having an abortion if I had been in that situation because I saw that when I was seven. Do you see? So, you know, bravo to those who put up the BART graphic pictures. Sorry, everyone, who's a, a, but it really will save other lives in the future, especially the very ones that the people, I don't want the children to see them. No. You, the children, and you have, you the adult has to explain it. Sorry, you have to explain it. Okay. When I was 18 years old, a dear relative of mine wrote me a letter from a thousand miles away that she was also 18 years old and pregnant. And from what she wrote, it was clear that she was glad to be having this baby, unexpectedly and young, but she was going to have the baby and likely marry her boyfriend, the father of the child. I immediately wrote her back, a letter of support and was very enthusiastic saying I would try to come a thousand miles to be there when the baby came. The next letter she wrote me, she explained with great sorrow that she had been reading my letter while on the train to the city to obtain an abortion. And that she was now writing back to share that sad fact with me that there was no more baby. I was absolutely stunned. This was the first real, to me, abortion I had ever heard about. A relative had an abortion, which meant the aborted child was my relative, a little baby in my family that was no more. <coughs> I was absolutely heartbroken. Later in college, I had a rather tragic and sudden death experience. After dating for just over a year, my college sweetheart and I were walking across campus when he collapsed. It turned out that he was experiencing a heart attack at age 19. It was ventricular arrhythmia. And while we were walking, for some reason, his heart skipped a beat in a way that locked it. And within four minutes, he had no oxygen in his brain. By the time the paramedics, and that caused him to collapse. By the time the paramedics uh, were called to the scene, there was nothing to be done. Although no one understood that, and they valiantly tried to revive him. His name was Jim O'Neill. And the moment of myself learning in the hospital that he was dead was one of the most shocking and saddest moments of my life. This was January 1984. Two years later, I was sharing a summer apartment with several girls, most of whom knew I was the girl whose boyfriend died. And one Saturday, a roommate began to share with me that she had had an abortion the previous year. She wanted to know how I, I felt having lost someone I loved because she was struggling with the death of her baby. And she wanted to know what a, another person who had experienced the death of a loved one felt to compare it to her intense feeling of loss. As she described all this to me, she just wailed and cried and, and losing control with great heaving sobs, described, I feel like this has been a death of a person I love so much, and it just hurts. This was a very painful moment for me to see up close. 
How very real was the unspoken grief of a woman who, had, who has had an abortion? I had not seen that before. Of course I hugged this gal and wept with her. There was another experience with abortion. At age 20, one of my childhood friends announced she was pregnant. This time I knew ahead of time, and she was very close by, and when she switched from being excited about the baby to considering abortion, I offered every kind of help I, to choose to keep the baby that I could think of. I didn't actually know about any crisis pregnancy centers. I just did what came to, you know, off the top of my head. What do you, um, you know, a, a friend from a youth group from another state is a friend of mine from college. Their youth group raised six hundred dollars. We'll send her money. Um, my mom offered to put housing at her house. We kept trying to untie the knots that were making her think that was what she had to do. There were two core phrases my friend kept saying about why she felt she must have the abortion. One, if my own mother won't support me, then why should I trust that anyone else will? Two, if you were my friend, you would go with me to the abortion appointment. I made it clear I would absolutely stand by her if she kept the baby, but I also made it clear that I would not participate in the abortion appointment. She went through it. With it. She went through with it. These three tangible experiences of abortion by people I knew deeply affected me. From my perspective, they each pointed to the dreaded reasons why abortion is terrible for women. It is the women who are shouldering the entire problem of the problem pregnancy. It is the women who must bend themselves into making sense of this dreaded repulsive to them act in order to make other people happy, in order to keep the peace. Women become accessories to this dreaded, awful, unnatural deed, done not only to their tiny, innocent child, but to their own bodies. This was hitting me hard when I was a young woman. Being pro-life is about helping women not feel that desperate. Excuse me. The abortion industry uses and relies on the remaining innocence of a gal to not realize till they are in the stirrups of the GYN position inside the abortion clinic and they really are like they can't almost they can't leave. Um, I was talking to a couple of gals. I don't mean I don't want to go on too much about this guys, but us gals know about that you're getting examined. It's, it's a very vulnerable way to be in a medical exam. And so when you can imagine a gal is in that position, this is what the abortion industry, they use this. They are not going to let you leave when you're in that position. As, you know, and that's often going to be the moment when a girl might really, really, really not want to do this. I want to get out of here. And it's very difficult. And they're at a place where they're, as a human being, like there's, all of us have probably experienced you don't want to say anything because you're afraid you're not going to be polite or something. That's a terrible way in which a woman's wanting to be nice, wanting to please somebody else, won't say what, right there is probably the gut moment she doesn't want to be doing this. And she can't get up and leave. And especially if she's taken anesthesia. Like that, like they have a twilight type thing that makes you kind of, half a week. I mean, it's, it, the whole process is just an awful abuse of a woman, you know. That's what I'm trying to hit home about. There is a lot of, of course, the outrage about the babies, which I'm all for. As I said, you know, graphic pictures need to be, you know, not constantly in everybody's face, but they can't be avoided, okay. The baby and the, the delicate beauty of the body and the, and the awfulness of its slaughtered body it should be shown. But I'm trying to say also, think about it. Think about how horrible that is for the, for the gal in these moments. They, you know, and, and, and we who've been involved for a long time with the Iowa counseling, we know women who have been at that point. Wow, they must have a steel of spine. They are able to get up and say, I don't want to do this, and they do leave. And there are, there's, a few, there's countless stories of that, children that are alive because of that moment. 
And I think the same thing is happening repeatedly and repeatedly since this abortion pill has been introduced. They're sent home with the pill, and this has been happening everywhere before you all, unfortunately, are now about to deal with it here. But girls are going home, and they're bleeding a lot, and they don't know what the what is happening. And it scares them, and there is a sense of not just being afraid for themselves and what this, all this bleeding is about, and cramping. If you've never had a baby, you, and you don't know what hard contractions are, it is very scary. And um, they pro there's, a, there's probably more than 50% of the, the scary moments during that kind of an abortion, by the medical abortion that you're sent home to do by, to bleed by yourself, where you're going, what am I doing? I, I want to stop this. I want, I want the baby. I want the baby. And that's where it really makes sense to try really hard to educate women about you can reverse. Because, you know, it's probably likely, young lady, that you're going to regret it in about two days when you start feeling this awful thing happening to you. So there's all these ways in which we should be there for them. In some, you know, the education on the morning after pill reversal, just being somewhat presence outside these places that do the surgical places, and when they've already done the deed and they are hurting, you know, and they need post-abortion help. Because honestly, the pro-life community provides that. Planned Parenthood does not. Okay? Okay. As I was finishing college, and very much connected to the tragic experience of losing my college sweetheart, I experienced a huge shift in my faith. I became aware of the need for a total commitment to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, the, and with the help of a few friends pointing the way, I made this commitment at age 19. Now, I was still, I was always a Catholic, I'm still a Catholic, I never stopped going to Mass. But I, I enhanced my faith life with going to pray, praise and worship prayer meetings and the, the little kind of home group I was at where they laid hands on me and I, I made this little prayer to like just come Holy Spirit and you know pour out more on me. Somebody looked at me and said, you're going to defend the Bible. I don't know why, but I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you that. This, this guy told me that. And I was like, oh, okay. And sure enough, that summer, I really, really, really read the Bible. Like, it was the best adventure book ever. And it really, really, you know, helped me understand Old Testament and New Testament. How, how much God loves us. <laughs> and, you know, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of, really bad stuff that the Israelites did and other people did to each other and God was trying to use some of those painful times to bring them back to him, right? And in the New Testament, we learn about how much he loved us that he gave us his only son. And I'm, the summer after the guy died, it was, you know, I, I still will tear up thinking about I really love that guy, Jim O'Neill. But you know what? God used that brokenness to bring me to a place of, you know, joy for the Lord. So that is a, a, also something about the pro-life movement that I think is a really beautiful thing. There's a lot of people that go through a lot of pain before they get to the place of humility and on their knees and awakening to, God has a plan for my life, God loves me, and I'm going to live it, you know, and I'm going to grab a hold of, you know, God and Jesus Christ is my Savior. So even though we can be very upset about what's going on here in Ireland with this terrible tsunami of abortion, there's going to have to possibly be some suffering, but it's going to possibly cause like something very different in joy that you couldn't have thought of, okay, amongst the people, amongst your neighbors, amongst even those hardcore people who voted yes, you know. With this powerful focus now leading my heart and mind, I was on the lookout for a way to serve God in a mission as I finished college. Now, I love Mother Teresa. I, I actually spent a couple weeks with her sisters at their house in D.C. And um, but I went to college in Washington, D.C. Mother Teresa says, love begins in your own backyard. And as I was really discerning things at the end of college and right after college, I realized the pro-life movement is my own backyard. That these abortion clinics are my own backyard. And 
I simultaneously, part of what made me kind of wake up and see that was other people were giving witness outside of the abortion clinics near where I lived, settled in Virginia. So this mission that unfolded for me was the pro-life movement and the ability to do something in the face of a modern day holocaust was um, the, the, the holocaust that the world has not seen before. You know, working on that. You okay? Somebody wants to sit right next to me. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming. So, yeah, so that's where I really felt I don't need to go to Calcutta to serve with Mother Teresa. I can, I got to roll up my sleeves and be part of this fight against abortion. For us in the United States, we are a living proof, sadly, that a culture, a society can in fact coexist with evil and still seem to thrive and lead the world in many amazing ways. But it is also a tremendous shocking victory of the evil one to have lulled our nation along with so many others into this catatonic acceptance of the coexistence in our own backyards of the bloodshed of, of help, innocent, helpless children who have been trapped in the name of choice into a horrible, painful death for simply being conceived at the wrong time and place according to the fears of their own mother, father, or grandparents. We do coexist with abortion in the United States. There are many, many people who don't give it a thought or the time of day for their entire lives or at the very least, dismiss it as something far removed from their everyday and as something only other people care about. I believe it is the same for a large percentage of the other nations who have allowed abortion to be legalized. Here in Ireland, I believe there are likely some of your family or friends who don't care. Anybody can testify to that? <laughs> Maybe there are some of us who are on the opposite side of this issue as you, maybe there are some in your family or friends who are on the opposite side of this issue as you are. And you cannot speak of it without it coming to near blows. Anybody had a punch nose from this? <laughs> uh, as surely there are polar opposites on the abortion debate in our American families as well. I have to tell you, when I was uh, first dating my husband, the second date, we were pulling up to New Year's Day at his sister's house, and uh, we had not really talked much about his family. We'd only gone on one or two dates, and I, so this was the big deal. Well, I was going to meet his family, and I said, so, how are, you know, do they, do they, do they know about you doing rescue and, you know, pro-life work? And he went, ah. Oh that we just don't talk about it. And I definitely was like, oh. I, you know, <laughs> but I understood. And it was sort of, you know, it, I ended up still, we, they are not horrible against us. That, and some of his siblings are very, very appreciative that we've kind of given a big part of our lives to this movement. But still, that was a little, that's, isn't that how we all have that? So... Okay, so some are hot, some are cold, and many are absolutely middle of the road indifferent about this wholesale slaughter across the world of our smallest brothers and sisters. And our Lord had strong words to say about those who are lukewarm. Does anybody know what he said? Mm -hmm. Spit them out. Right. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. And I just want to say, I'm a Catholic. I had to look that up. I did not have that memorized. <laughs> as far as the verses and the, and the, and the chapter. Um, how can we change this? How can we make more people, all people, understand that this abortion culture must end and we must become a culture of life forever? There are many, many people who will forever be stuck in the thinking that an abortion is nothing different than the removal of a tooth or, of a tooth or an appendix. So how is it that we can finally make abortion as popular as a pay phone? I want to know. That's, I believe it can happen. 
I'm not sure I have the exact magic words, but how can we make it as completely unacceptable as slavery? We have to keep stigmatizing abortion for the horrendous act that it is. Like I've already said a couple times now, the, the graphic pictures have a role. Okay? Yeah, no time and place sometimes. But we can't totally eradicate them. There's got to be a balance in the appropriate moments and not just forever banishing them, okay, in the pro-life movement, okay? It is the only way that the pro-life movement in the United States has stayed alive, okay? I mentioned the predecessor to Life, Life, Life Action and Lila Rose was this Mark Crutcher. He's a Baptist fellow. He um, has life dynamics. I called him and asked him, I told you, I called a lot of people, before, said, I'm going to go over there and, and, and I want to share everything I can of wisdom from the sages in the pro-life movement. And, I, and he's the one that has said, well, the only way that our pro-life movement has stayed alive is that we keep stigmatizing abortion, okay? Now, I'm just going to take a guess that most of us are, are we're disappointed with the gay marriage vote, too. Right? Yes, yeah. okay. darling. He brought that up as saying, in our United States and all over the world, the whole gay, gay same-sex stuff has been mainstreamed. And that's the success of the homosexual lobby over the last 30 or 50 years. They've mainstreamed perversion mm -hmm. to the point that we are loons if we say anything mm -hmm. contradictory to the idea mm -hmm. of two men being so-called married or two women being so-called married or then don't even get started on the whole gender stuff, you know, with LGBTQ and the, the whole trans. Oh, it's nuts. But it's become mainstreamed and he said that just barely hasn't happened with abortion. And the only reason it hasn't happened is because the pro-life movement won't let it go down. You know, we won't shut up about it being something to stigmatize. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is just something that thankfully you can't deny the graphic pictures. That's why it stays stigmatized, you know. But also, this, the, you know, there are plenty of, I'm just at the beginning, I listed all those organizations. There's all different facets and angles to the gruesomeness of abortion that many different organizations have taken to rise up and wave banners about. This is why it's bad. This is why it's bad. And it's, it's, not, it's not being... Anyway, I'm just... You get the idea. Don't let it be mainstream. Now, I would like to, I mean, except that I feel very much like pro-life is my main thing, I would like to really ruminate on how do we unmainstream the same sex stuff, you know? I know, I, I, if you want to talk at another time, like after this is over, I know somebody who's actually a former homosexual man who's working really hard to uncover the horrible ugliness of the homosexual community. And he is an on fire Catholic man who he is trying to stigmatize it all again. <laughs> but he's a little bit of a David against Goliath. But in the meantime, in my opinion, it is almost completely mainstreamed. The main reason is that it's still stigmatized that abortion is always going to be absolutely horrible. I already said that. The second reason is that it will remain stigmatized is that we won't let it go. Right? <laughs> Have you studied the life of William Wilberforce? Who knows who that is? Yes. yes. No. yes. Okay. Now, don't be embarrassed, but I didn't see every hand raised. Who doesn't know at all who that is? Okay, because there's a few of you, I'm going to read as fast as I can a little excerpt I got from Wikipedia. William Wilberforce was born in 1759 and died in 1833. He was a British politician, philanthropist, and a leader of the movement to stop the slave trade. Okay, he began a political career in 1780, eventually becoming a member of parliament for Yorkshire. He was independent of party. In 1785, he became an evangelical Christian. Yay! Which resulted in major changes to his lifestyle and a lifelong concern for social reform and progress. He was educated at St. John's College, Cambridge. In 1787, he came into contact with, and I want to just, just, I want you to think right now, you are these people. 
Okay, who are these people? He came into contact with Thomas Clarkson and a group of anti-slave trade activists, including Granville Sharp, Hannah Moore, and Charles Middleton. They persuaded Wilberforce to take on the cause of abolition, and he soon became one of the leading English abolitionists. Somewhere else that I read, I was rereading a little bit about him, he was about to quit Parliament because of his conversion, feeling like he maybe wants to be a missionary or go into the seminary or something. And these people I just named were like, no, we need you in the Parliament to fight. And so he stayed, okay? It, he headed the parliamentary campaign against the British slave trade for 20 years until the passage of the Slave Trade Act of 7, 1807. Wilberforce supported the campaign for the complete abolition of slavery and continued his involvement after 1826 when he did resign from Parliament because of his failing health. That campaign led to the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. That's the year he died. Um, the, um, which abolished slavery in most of the British Empire. The Wilberforce died just three days after hearing that, that the passage of the Act through Parliament was assured. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, close to his friend, William Pitt the Younger. Okay, so, um, you, you see I said, I mentioned you guys, we, we grassroots people. Those four people <coughs> helped him hold on to, wait a minute, you're, a position, you're in a position of power, you're in a position of, being able to speak, so don't stop, and stay where you are, and it, like that's what we, you know, um, I know there's Carol Nolan, mm -hmm. Pindar, mm -hmm. am I saying it right? Hutter, 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 did I say it right? Yeah. Yeah. There's so many little ways with the Irish language, like, <laughs> I am going to mess it up. So, I mean, those type of people, they, they should be supported, and I mean, I have witnessed the splintering and arguing about, wow, they're not for life enough, <laughs> or some people, or, I mean, that happens in our, in our country, too. Um, I don't know what to say about how do you, there's got to be an ability to be very, very diplomatic in, 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 the, in this kind of, in this very delicate situation. You've got to try to just keep encouraging the person to not, compromise on their core principles that you liked about them to begin with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But And it may be, like this example of William Wilberforce, instead of withdrawing from politics, they'll be encouraged because you encourage them. Okay? Uh, have you ever heard of the movie Amaz Amazing Race? It was out in 2006. It's about him. Mm -hmm. I, if you're writing notes or whatever, go, bar go rent or borrow that movie somehow. You know, I, it is absolutely, to me, a tutorial for the pro-life movement. Sorry, what's it called again? Amazing, Amazing Grace. And if you didn't know this, you probably, some of you probably do know, but John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. Yeah. Um, he was a ship mm -hmm. captain for the, in the slave trade. And he had, he had a complete conversion, different and, and uh, separate from William Wilberforce. But they did have, you know, he kind of influenced William Wilberforce. And, but he spent the rest of his life trying to, you know, make up for his past sins of involvement in that. And he wrote that song, he wrote it as a, like, more of a poem. And it was later set to music, Amazing Grace. Does anybody, like, know that song, at least the one verse of it? Yeah, it's in a great song. Amazing. So they, so they have in the movie an overlay of their two lives, but it's mostly about William Wilberforce. I, but it's such a great movie. I really recommend it. I don't think it did the greatest in the box office when it came out in 2006, but it's something that you can pass around amongst each other, get a, a DVD of it. This is about the life of William Wilberforce and his lifelong quest in slavery and the stubborn attitudes of the people of his times holding on to those barbarian attitudes that dehumanize other human beings. That is something to study. Okay? I want to study it to try to decode this special kind of detachment from love that requires one in the pro-abortion camp to think to continue to justify the slaughter. They have indeed euphemized it so much, it meaning abortion, they have indeed euphemized it so much, where am I? I, I got a hand signal from Leo, where am I? That they, have, that they simply believe the lie of the veil they themselves have placed over the bloody truth. Right? 
Um, I just want to go back to an, a very, very fresh example of somebody like William Wilberforce. In USA and Ohio, did any of you follow that there was a heartbeat bill? That was, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. those, who, who does not know what I'm talking about? No. Raise your hand high, because I don't, okay. So, um, in a nutshell, I didn't know this until I was, I was hanging out with somebody recently who knew the lady, I don't know her name, but a lady for, in Ohio, she's been like on the outside of the legislative process, not a natural legislator in Ohio, but she's pushed for this heartbeat bill for eight years, and it's been going, like, through the cycle of it gets to the point where a committee passes it and then it goes out to the, f the full um, House of Representatives in Ohio and it gets not passed. Mm -hmm. And then she figured out how to, what can we do to reward this that you would vote for it? Another year. It took, you know, one year after another, she kept going back to senators and legislators in her state. And it's, it's gone up for vote like two or three times in the past eight years. And this time they thought they had a veto proof majority in the Senate and the legislator of their state, and then their governor, Kasich, vetoed it, and the one person who said they would vote to make sure the veto was over it changed their mind. Like, this is like right around Christmas time, just a few weeks ago. So, wow. I just mentioned it's on Laura Ashburn's news, news, Newsweek. Okay. Who is she now? Pardon? Laura Ashburn? For uh, EWTN. Oh, of, right. In, in yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they would definitely have something like that. You can look, at, look that up on EWTN. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, so you get the idea. I mean, I, I don't understand it. Like, why can't logic just win? Why? <laughs> We're in a weird place, aren't we? Um, <clears throat> I, I keep wondering if there would be a simple turn of phrase that could melt the cold ice of logic holding my pro-choice neighbors hostage. Because that sure would be easier if we could have a handle on those words and turn that key and set them free, right? I want to say this, I do strongly believe that the core reason that the people at the top who make abortion like a sacred cow, never to be seen for the rot that it really is, is they have been involved in abortion in some way. And further, there is a shame and secret about this that they are hiding. And this is why they justify it. Uh, often it will only be after great loss or suffering that those hard-hearted people will crumble. So... I mentioned, I have some notes here about, you know, this, this whole battle, like this hard attitude, it really is where Jesus says this type of problem can only be solved with prayer and fasting. And I was just talking to somebody this morning, they were telling me about you've had some people in your country who've done fasts, mm -hmm. really long fasts. Mm -hmm. A couple, more than a couple people? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lord, why didn't you answer their prayer? <laughs> <laughs> oh... Anyway, Laura, I, I, I think you'd be surprised that prayers have been answered, yeah. but not the big battle. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But they have been answered in some, in, in, in many dimensions. The other reason why the other side don't want to change is fear. Yeah. The reason they don't want to, that heart bill, for example, it's fear of the repercussions mm. as they see it. Mm. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. People make a, a, a bad decision, make a mistake, and they want to turn the clock back. And yeah. the human nature being what it is, you know, they'll try their damnedest to do whatever it takes. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's really, because yeah. yeah. at heart we're selfish, mm -hmm. you know? And, and yet the reality is nowadays, even if you're married, you don't have to rear a child you don't want. You really don't. Yeah. Bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, the best method I know for conversion is to simply be there for our little brothers and sisters and their mothers. It is the witness at the cross that the mother of Jesus and John the Beloved gave. They were there for Jesus. They had to watch as the soldiers nailed our Lord to the cross, as Jesus was lifted up in agonizing pain, the ripped skin from his scourging being ripped again. 
They were not able to climb up on a ladder and release Jesus from his torture, from his dying moments. But they were faithful. They stayed by his side. They were comforting our Lord to the end and gave witness to his last breath. His words, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And because of their faithfulness in a moment when the other followers of Jesus had fled, they were able to hear and receive the last wishes of Jesus. Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his beloved disciple, Behold your mother. Our Lord told us, through his dying words, to his own mother and disciple, to be faithful to one another and take care of each other. To me, I see this as a direct order from Jesus to behold all mothers and care for them as our own family. This is what the pro-life apostolate is about. Now, I went over some of the many, many parts of this generous movement which seek peace in the womb and in the lives of the hurting woman feeling driven to abortion. So many crisis pregnancy centers around the world. And here in Ireland, Gianna Care and Ask Magella and others. Here is a letter I'm going to read really quick through. I was just found it when I was trying to look, locate the names of your crisis pregnancy centers. Like, I put crisis pregnancy centers in Ireland in a Google search, and I found this letter to the Irish, to you, from the founder of Heartbeat International. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's an organization that supports and networks all the crisis pregnancy centers as best as they participate in the networking that that offers around the world. Okay, so let me just read this. It's really a well-stated letter because it addresses the idea of even in the political skirmishes, you still want to try to go, uh, you know, for to try to undo this terrible thing. You're going to have to help the women that are still going to go like drones to the abortion clinic, unfortunately. Dear friends, last week the wicked will of the Irish voters followed the pattern found in Scripture, where quote in those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> we mourn this loss, and that's from Judges chapter 17, verse 6. We mourn this loss with you. Um, am I moving too much, John? No, you're okay. 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 Um, there is no silver lining to be found. However, there is another pattern in Scripture to lean on in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 8, verse 8 and 9. St. Paul notes, quote, we are stressed, we are pressed on all sides but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. It is, Can you just repeat the reference? Uh, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 4, mm -hmm. 8 and 9. Okay? It's also important to remember that the Church of the New Testament was strengthened through persecution. Scattered from Jerusalem meant greater impact across the known world. There are still political avenues to pursue, but through those take time to effectively unfold. Even then, many are and will remain disillusioned with the political climate that allowed this defeat. We are, quote, struck down but not destroyed. Unquote. Now is the time to intentionally renew the importance of a prudential practical response to the change in the law, even while political hand-wringing continues. The shift to an abortion culture in Ireland, as you know, will further objectify women, encourage irresponsible sex, and of course place women and babies at risk for abortion. Effective pregnancy health outreach is the most important thing to accomplish in, be in between and in parallel to political skirmishes. The women who will be at risk for abortion in the coming weeks and months simply can't wait for the political situation to get straightened out. Take it from your friends in the states. We've been at this for 40 plus years and the only consistently positive gains in countering abortion over these, those years is the work of Pregnancy Health out Center Outreach. Let me encourage you to see the discouragement fellow pro-lifers have in the leaders of the country and the politics as an opportunity to engage them in what can make real impact one life at a time. It's not as glamorous a win as a constitutional protection of life, but it is necessary for the lives now at risk. We stand with you prayerfully and practically. We've learned a lot about taking on big abortion in our country, 
We'd be honored and privileged to help with next steps in Ireland. Now more than ever, it's important for like-minded, life-minded, life Christ-minded people to stand together. Let us know how we can help. Prayerfully, Jor L. Godsey, President of Heartbeat International. I actually didn't know about his name and who he was, but I kind of got it once I read through some of the stuff on the website. What's his so, name, Jorel? It's like a hyphenated name, J-O-R hyphen E, capital E, L, God C. Yes. Now, I just have to, I have more to say, and I want to see, uh, I was um, getting this from Lee in the background. We had the plan to have a, a, a little video of my friends in Philadelphia, including some of my family, that we, it's, it's um, and I want to, it took a, kind of some confusion about getting a projector, and so we're going to play it later, but I want to make sure it's 510. Is anybody okay with, like, the wait until we get the video set up? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I just want to um, finish up what I was saying, and then we'll take a break, and we'll do that. Just a little bit. I want to recommend, I have the books. There's a couple of the folks who came in a, a little bit after, but we passed around books because I only have one copy of this. I only found this the day I was leaving. Um, from, I didn't have time to order it for any more copies. But this is, these are two books that those who hadn't seen it, if you want to pass it around or look at it when we take a break. But I would recommend, this is out of print. I have no idea how to get it. Um, I just haven't had a chance to really think it out. But we might be able to figure out how to get other copies. But that abandoned book is, is not out of print, and it's able to be easily ordered. And I would recommend everybody read it because it's a history of the rescue, pro-life, every kind of thing of pro-life, crisis pregnancy help, sidewalk counseling help, laws and attempts to, to overturn abortion. It's a really good summary. So, um, so I'm recommending those books. Another uh, couple of movies I was going to recommend is has anybody heard of the movie Bella? Yes. yes. Have all of you seen it? No, no. I tried to get it into Garter Lane and um, what is Some the artist? What is it's Sergeant an Lane? arts an arts outfit in oh, Waterford. Okay. And um, the lady was all enthusiastic, but then she must have Googled it and discovered it was pro life, Caroline Senior. Well, so she have wouldn't to allow just, it. You just need She's to, gone now. There's you just need to else. order two or three copies, in my opinion. Yeah. Order two or three copies of it and give them to friends. But this was for the public. This, I mean, yeah, they, I they had other stuff. Like and nowadays, the everybody looks at things. Yeah. Everybody looks at things on their screens. You know, yeah. you can watch whole movies on your phone. And <laughs> it just seemed like a pity and a lost opportunity. It is. It is. It is. But I there agree. is a new director, so maybe we could <coughs> well, try again. Right. Try again. But I'm just saying, Bella is a, is a very a very poignant movie. It was made about ten years ago at this point now, and um, it's it's kind of hip as far as younger people. Um, it's about a crisis pregnancy situation. Okay. Um, it, it's a Wonderful Life. I just love that movie. And, but it's, it's all about how every life matters, right? And I just, I just you know, if, if, we've, if we've had a bad week in the pro-life fight, just get that movie and watch it. And just lift your hearts up, okay? <laughs> Uh, Meet John Doe is a very old movie, actually also by Frank Havra, who directed in, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Has anybody ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. no. it's, it's, it's probably something that you have to find on like um, the Google version or YouTube version that you can maybe find. But I recommend that because that's also about every life matters kind of thing. Um, and I already mentioned Amazing Grace, that movie. So those are kind of just a few ideas to help lift your spirits and Books that I would recommend, I've already passed that, Abandoned Around, and The Prison Letters of Joan Andrews. Um, the Walls Are Talking, Former Abortion Clinics Workers Tell Their Stories. Has anybody heard of Abby Johnson? Yes. yes. Okay. Has anybody here not heard of Abby Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she is, she is a, a, in 2009, she had a shocking experience. She was working for eight years as a, as a first just a, a lower level employee and then eventually was a manager of a rather busy abortion, uh, Planned Parenthood abortion clinic in Texas. 
Um, she was asked to hold her. She mostly was a promote. She managed people and promoted their biz their their business of Planned Parenthood. But so she was administrative more, and she was asked to come into a room and hold a wand over a lady's belly while they did an ultrasound guided abortion because the visual person wasn't there. Oh, okay, I'll do that. And she was standing there. She had a baby. And maybe she was pregnant with another one. I don't remember where she was exactly at that point. She was married with children. She had two abortions. Part of her story, she had abortions also. So, but like at this point, she was also now a mom and had experienced her on ultrasounds. But here she was watching on ultrasound because she was part of the team watching the ultrasound to make sure that the doctor was properly ripping apart the baby. Like it can be done properly. And she's watching the baby getting ripped apart. And she just barely got through doing what was asked of her. And she walked out of the building and went across the street to the pro-life ministry that had been actually across the street for several years called 40 Days for Life. That 40 Days for Life started right next to them. And it's grown all over the world now. But she said, knock, knock, knock. I, I need to talk to you guys. And she came in and fell apart. Balled her eyes out. There's more to it that I'm giving you a summary. It's a good she was in, powerful story. She was in Unplanned. Dublin to give an address to the pro life campaign oh, a few months yep. ago. Okay. And the name of the book is quite a powerful woman. Yeah. The book is called Unplanned. It's a true Her, her unplanned. first book is Unplanned. Mm. I mean, she went, she, she definitely kind of made the circuit with news media, book writing, lectures, and she still goes around. She actually has gone on to. Um, I think she came from a Baptist background, and she and her husband converted to the Catholic faith, and they have like just had twins recently, and they have just seven kids. Yeah. So she's a really on fire young. She's probably now forty something um, now. She was even inspired to after all that she'd been through. She, she was inspired to and practice natural family planning. Yeah. And yeah. I was convicted for, about the whole thing that she was interested. Yeah. With. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, her latest book is The Walls Are Talking, Former Abortion Clinic Workers Tell Their Stories. So I just recommend that because I think that's going to be fascinating reading. And what I was talking about is learn your enemy. <laughs> that's going to help you understand, I think, like what we need to know to try to say kind words to somebody who may be at the verge of giving up being involved in abortion. It might turn around. She also founded an organization, and then there were none, which is all about helping people get out of working at abortion clinics, from doctors to nurses to receptionists to security guards, and finding another job for them. I saw you do the timeout, but I was just, I want to finish the talking part that I, um, anyway. This C.S. Lewis, who doesn't know who C.S. Lewis is? The okay. Muslim films. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to know that nobody raised their hand to that. So, the, the preeminent thing that I think is also another way to study the mind of our enemy is through tape letters. Yeah. Mm. Who has not read that? Temptations from a senior devil to a junior devil. Yeah. Yes. If you haven't read it, I have to say, I've, I've read parts of it in the many years ago. I need to reread it myself. Uh, my, young, my young kids have, over the last few years in school, had to read it. So I've heard about it afresh recently in, in the last 10 years. But um, it's, real, it's about a, a, a senior devil orchestrating how his pupil devil manipulates the mind of his special person he, he's, work, he's assigned to manipulate. And it, it's very interesting. Sorry, what's the name of that? The Screw Tape, tape, tape Letters. Yes, tape. The devil. He has a conference every year. Right. <laughs> with the junior devils. <laughs> <laughs> and the other book by C.S. Lewis, there's the series, is the Narnia Chronicles. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're like, we know they're written for children. I didn't read it until, I tell you when I was reading it, as a newly married person, 26, 27 years old. And we would read it, my husband and I, Back in the day, 90, 91, we didn't have smartphones, and we would actually read in the car while we were driving. We didn't even listen to CDs. We would just read. And um, we read those books to each other whenever we went somewhere. And um, 
we got to the last battle. Does anybody know all seven of the books? Well, the last battle is about the, the, the end. It's like a C.S. Lewis version of allegory of how it's like in heaven and those p people that didn't make it and those who are in there with you. And Anyway, and there is a battle at the end. Um, but um, the week that this was happening, the week that we were right at that book, we had a miscarriage. And I, uh, we were, one had a honeymoon baby, we had a five-year honeymoon and a miscarriage. So the week of the miscarriage, I finished that book and it brought this, the grief I was having over, oh, no, and a, two things happened. I was in solidarity a little bit with women who have abortions. Like, the Lord allowed that for me to experience. Like, when I talk about the cramping and the heavy bleeding, I kind of know what that's like. And when you haven't had a birth and a whole full pregnancy, and then you have that, it's, it's a whole experience that you don't get to, you get it. Like birthing a child. Am I right, moms? Yeah. <laughs> There's, you don't get childbirth until you've done it. But also the loss of a child in, in utero is so awful, and you don't know. If, and reading The Last Battle really helped me to understand about God's plan for salvation, even through tragedy and lost people in our lives, that we may still have hope that they can get there with him. It, you have to read it. So, But I think it's a very encouraging whole, all seven books, about this life on this planet that we're you know, having to struggle with. It's a very good book, even if you think it's just for children. I think it would be a, a, a spiritual help. So... Um, the attitude of, dif of indifference by those who are not willing to admit that abortion is horrible is the hardest aspect of the work. Keep, I keep saying that. Another as hard aspect is that many women are unmovable in their decision to have the abortion by the time we might encounter them at the sidewalks of the abortion clinics. The only and main thing I can offer for how to manage the, need, the needed effort to always try to be there to witness, counsel, and offer a ride away from these death camps is that we must put on our spiritual armor. And that's probably like the biggest thing I want to say and something that some of my friends who are the videotapes repeat this basic thing. For Catholics, we have the Mass. We have our sacraments. We can regularly examine our consciences and go to confession. And for any of those who are serious Christians, with the help of Psalms 51, you can grow in your understanding of your great need for humble, contrite hearts. This is Psalm, part of Psalm 51, starting with verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O Lord, O God, you who are my Savior, our God, my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. See, the Lord wants us to turn to him and be humble, and then he will give us the words to help sinners, you know. But we have to also admit, we're sinners too. They're about I, but for the grace of God. All of us are got to be honest about that. And, and have that humility kind of constantly in your mind. Keep yourselves in check. Because that humility is part of giving you spiritual armor. Get right with God. That is the first key to trying to be faithful to God's call on your hearts in this battle. So a four-point summary of that is pray, examine, repent, receive Jesus. Right? Our Catholic sacraments are based on that. And a good Christian church, a non-denom or another denomination, is going to teach that. Because we need to pray, examine, repent, and receive Jesus. Now, one of the other persons that um, I talked to is a long-term pro-life rescue guy and sidewalk counselor guy out in St. Louis. His name's John Ryan, and he said this to me on the phone a couple days ago. He said, tell the Irish people, Every second that goes by, you're getting used to it. Do you understand what he means? Yeah. yeah. We know what that means. I think, like the hardcore pro-lifers, we are dying to like not have this be acceptable. And we want everyone to just wake up right now, wake up yesterday, and have flipped it and 
and everybody have their conversions, but and vote it back. Away, you know. But he and I and many of the people we know that there may be a place and a time for civil disobedience. So I'm not um, saying that's the only thing to do, but I'm kind of in a way saying I'm giving you permission. Don't rule it out. And that's what we mean by every second that goes by, you're getting used to it. Now, I was thrilled when I was getting a message from a couple people through Facebook Messenger that there was this thing today at 11 a.m. across the whole country, as po best as possible, people stood for an hour at a GP near you that is listed as, a rec as either a referral GP for abortion or actually going to do abortions or the abortion film. Right? That happened today. I, I got to stand. Hmm? I mean, during the abortion, no. Hmm. Was it against the law, though, before? No, it's been made before. No, no, no. It's a new pill now. It's a pill of up to nine weeks. It's like a before it was stronger like, pill. Yeah. Before it was early, early pregnancy. Early, early pregnancy. Well, what I was trying to bring up is that. Has that been done before? I mean, this list of GPs is a new whole battleground. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, how many of you guys were there this morning for an hour? Okay. For an hour. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the time. Yeah. But so, so I, I haven't been able to get on social media to see, like, you know how it is to pass pictures around. <laughs> and maybe there are, there were a hundred places where people were today. I don't know how many there are. But it's not fully organized yet because we don't really know for sure the doctors yet and the surgeries. And then we need a pro-life organization to organize these groups and places to go. So we're at the very early stages, you know. Yeah, but, but still, the call to try something. Yeah. That's, not, that's, that's what, like, it's, the, it's what I mean by every second that goes by you're getting used to it. People should not be getting used to this. Yeah, but we don't want to think about outside the doctor's stand or not doing the abortions, you know? I know. But, it's, yeah, it's yeah, very hard today now to try and get confirmation. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was only a, a, an intermediate or very initial list. But the good thing about doing it today was that that's going to spread around. Mm -hmm. And the doctors who are going to sit on the fence are going to go. Exactly. I don't want them outside. Make around. it, you stigmatize know? it, yeah. stigmatize it, stigmatize yeah. it. That's the thing. I know what you're saying. You want to protect the reputations of the good doctors. I get exactly. it. We want to be careful where we. Life Institute and Dorsters, they came out on Thursday night. Yeah. You see yeah, and Team Jackson, so. Yeah. yeah. But Tim Jackson is the kind of missing yeah. yeah. part of the fight. He's only in the very early stages. We, we need to, you know. But there's legislation coming in, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Would that go true, though? Oh, true. Oh, of course, we still do it. You mean to like create bubble zones? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 but. That, well, that's again, fight it, fight it, fight it. Yeah. You know, don't get don't get used to bubble zones. We've actually Britain has had it struck down. There was a there was an effort. It actually only just was trying to be ha in, in, enacted in last summer. But before the fall, they had some court threw it out. Oh, absolutely. So, we just to acknowledge how strong the other side is. The yeah. culture at the moment agrees with buffer zones and the other side. You know, so it's grand said and fight it. If legislation comes in, but if legislation comes in stopping people. Organizing outside GP classes, it's going to be pretty hard to do. Well, well what what I've observed, the of us. what I've observed if is, out, is if there's a thousand people outside, or so they have felt the poor harshness with them too. Well, hold on, what I, what I want to I want to ask you guys something. I've heard it up to my eyeballs that the you can't trust the Irish media at all. No. Is that no. pretty much oh, yeah. true? Yes. So so the source of this, what I read of. Which person said it? Simon Harris or the Prime Minister? That he was going to enforce bubble zones. So okay. okay. I want to know, because I really don't understand, how can how, how can a health minister, his words, put in an Irish Times article, all of a sudden have everybody so scared, oh, it's true, there's bubble zones. Yeah. It didn't happen yet. And this is the thing. This is what I want to say. It, it ha You have to... You have to, while there's no bubble zones, do everything you can to not get used to it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being pretty uh, bold here because 
This is the time to stand in the way on that day. That, you know, I was saying stand in the way on the first day. Well, you know, we don't know exactly. Apparently, there has been a first day. The, the first day has been a moving target for the past couple of weeks, has it not? We thought it was going to this past Monday. At the lady there with a question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go what ahead. What form does the protest take? In the case of this morning, I wasn't there. Um, a we don't know how many people who are going into that practice were going with ordinary illnesses. They weren't, it's not in fact a clinic, it's a GP's uh, a But GP's they weren't open. General. Yeah, exactly. They weren't yeah, open today. Yeah. Okay, but in the case of, uh, you know, we really don't know. I get it. Yeah, it's you know, you can't confusing. approach people or you can't, you know, what form. Would you it's a vision. Say, okay, okay, let me just say let me just say oh. this. What I'm sensing here is a very ladylike, polite attitude towards all the the dignity of the good guys who yes. don't want to mess up and blemish their so day. I get it. And that I get it. But the truth of the matter is you they have power yes. of their paying rent, doing business, yes. rubbing shoulders with the ones who are good becoming the Judases. Yes. Okay, so they need to still, you need to be there and say, yeah, I'm not form. sure which one of these doctors it is and which building, but it's somewhere at this address. There's somebody doing this, and I'm not going to go away till I know so they're gone. It's just so a, that Dr. Smith, or, or whatever, that is a good guy, he's going to go and talk to Dr. Jones and say, get out of here. <laughs> I know what you're doing. And then... Other doctors, that's yes. it's it's a domino effect that you want to have the control of. Yes. I'm trying to say your fear of not wanting to say the wrong thing is exactly the position that Simon Harris wants you in. Yes. And all the pro what, I mean, you the world. don't actually approach anybody. Is it no, just a no. silent you you step back, your presence? Well, is that, well, is that the, what you're talking I about? I think so. I mean I think that a small leaflet that says the name of the doctor who's on the list, that should be part of what you're doing. That, like, I mean, I went with um, um, Lucy McDonald, I think she works with yeah. Gianna Care. I, I, she hosted me last night. So I went with her and a, and a gal, Helena. Oh, yes, Helena. She, she couldn't come here because she had another commitment. So she wanted to meet me and she kind of went out of her way to come towards the edge of Dublin where. Lucy lives, and we met, we went to Mass, and then we went to the 11 o'clock time to be, I don't remember. Crumlin. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I'm, it's all kind of foreign to me. I'm just like, wherever you tell me to go, I'll stand. And um, literally the, the number 130, 153, or whatever the address is, 3, 351, was written in like a child's scribble on the tile of this bunch of row houses and the per ticket it you could barely figure out which house it was and it was um up high on the door like a, a sign and it had a different doctor's name on the sign that wasn't the one that we were supposed to be and we stood there for quite a while three or four ladies all on their smartphones and I heard the name Tim <laughs> they were saying Tim says and well and then um Lucy had the presence of mind to ask a few people walking by, do you know if this is Dr. Anya? Whatever the lady's name was. And they went, like, a couple people, no, I don't know, I don't know. And then two or three later, oh yeah, that's where she, her office is. It's in the same place with this O'Connell. So, okay, so we got to verify that name was definitely 100% of lady doctor who's going to either, whatever you call it, recommend, Sorry. refer, to someone or prescribe the pill or well, maybe set up a surgical abortion. They're actually abortion. going to have, no, not surgical abortions. The surgical abortions are going to be carried out in the maternity hospitals in the country. Yeah. They're, the doctors, some of the doctors are supplying the medical abortions. Right. And that's totally separate from the morning after pills that they've been dispensing yeah. for a number of years now. So they're going to provide the medical abortions in their yeah. surgery. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying I had the experience of some of this confusion. That was clearly not the name that we were told was at this address. 
And, and it was a little, sh in my opinion, just like, it was just a normal, a whole bunch of row houses and it didn't look like doctor's offices at all. So the other thing is you're right there in front of people's regular homes. Yes. And you feel, you feel bad, but from my perspective, after this, from I don't know if it comes from a hard nose doing this for many years at this point, I don't care. They need to, those neighbors need to put the pressure on them. We are helping put up clique light, you know, stadium lights on this mm -hmm. thing going on in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So your neighbors are now going to have to make a decision. And God will hold you accountable for now you've been given information. What did you do with it? Are you just going to sit there and sit on your hands and go, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything. But you have to. I mean, that's how it, it's, that's how you're going to, we're going to ever get the eventual victory is to stigmatize. Unfortunately, it sounds awful. It doesn't sound very ladylike or gentlemanly like, but somehow find it within you in the this, this sweetness that you have to say things sweetly. Like, I'll just give you an example. Hold on a minute. I, I say this to the escorts who are there. At, when no girls are coming, I just say, you know, you're going to be held accountable by God for being an accessory to dismembering little children. Now, did I sound mean? And a little bit pushy, maybe. But I'm trying, I mean, I said, we had a guy come today while we were standing there who said, what are you here for? Oh, is that a place that's doing abortions? Oh, let me get pictures with the Jesus freaks. <laughs> and he really was, he turned into one nasty thing after another. And it was, I was surprised because I thought we were in a very humble, gentle, quiet no. neighborhood. But I, I turned to the ladies and they were like, they were like, yeah, this is the kind of thing that we dealt with constantly during the campaign, before the vote. What were you going to say? I'm so, so sorry. See, um, Harris has been very clever throughout this campaign by actually giving it uh, the abortion referrals to GPs. Exactly. Because everybody, at some stage, sooner or later, uses a general practitioner. So the problem for some pro-life people is, what is it turn if it turns out that your own doctor, whom you've been using for years, is doing it? Where do you go? Do well, you go? well, this is the yeah, point. For you your say. Throat or whatever. Well, but but yeah. that's the point. That, that, yeah. That's one of the dilemmas for pro life people. The second thing is that um, a question what action do you take? Now, I can understand the confusion. A list was sent out about the GPs, right? There are at least 100 GPs who have signed up who have decided to remain anonymous for the time being. Oh, okay. now, I, I know, but it, it, it's actually going to take a bit of time to establish who is and who isn't. Yeah. So there is some confusion. Yes, yeah. Now, I can understand being hard-nosed, but at the same time, um, obviously there's going to be action at some point. The White Cross movement is actually... Jim Jackson did this uh, on the day that the, that, that the legislation was going to be signed, or thought was going to be signed, there were white crosses put outside the president's uh, Was residence. that December 20th? Uh, so, yes, yeah. it was, yeah. 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 So, so there is a move there, and there is a, some of the pro-life groups have decided not to be involved in direct action. We've already been challenged by... Wait, wait, wait. You went from telling about the crosses being put up to some of the pro-life groups decided not to. What happens? Well, I'm just Was saying... Was that what? a reason why? No, 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 no. It's a separate issue. Oh. It's a separate issue. The point, you were saying earlier that pro-life groups do things differently, and yeah. that's the reality. Yeah. But the thing is this, is that some pro, one pro-life group, one major pro-life group, has said that it won't get involved in these things. The Life Institute is a bit different. The Life Institute are like the stormtroopers, and um, well, that's how I do. Anyway, and Tim Jackson is one of the driving forces now, uh, and, and he's very committed. The problem is he is saying not to talk to media, and as a former journalist, I think that's a big mistake. Um, uh, but but the point is this: there is confusion as to who is doing it. That's the problem. Who's doing any who's abortions? abortions? Who's doing oh, the abortions? abortions. But Simon Harris, Harris has been very clever by making GPs as opposed to separate clinics be the ones that do the, 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 the because he knows it's going to I'm going to just people. say this, but first I want to, this young lady's been raising her hand, but I want to just ask this, and no, don't answer it right now because I think it could be a, a real hornet's nest, but I'm just dying where I'm just, you know, watching all this on the internet in Pennsylvania, like, how does 
Justice Simon Harris has so much power, and when can he, when can he please be unelected or thrown out? Please. Okay. But Two what and a half years. Oh! <laughs> Yeah, it's just about the GPs, like the guy in my GP um, is given the abortion, the same party abortion, but he's not on the list. Mm. How, how do you said. know that he is? So, because I rang up oh. and I asked. Like a mock? But the, the, one, the, the one thing I'd say is and that... And they said, yeah, it is being offered here, and that was fine, I said no more, but I believe in that GP, because I wouldn't, wouldn't go to a GP, but... Um, yeah. So I'm I want to look for a new one. Yeah. Even though I was with them ten well, I years. Just, I just want to suggest. What is your name? Sharon. Sharon. I want to suggest, and everybody else, honestly, don't miss the opportunity. Go ahead and leave, shake the dust from your oh, feet. Oh yeah. But write a note to him and say why. Yeah. Oh, yes. You know. Yeah. And it might cause a conversion, and he yeah. will. You can go back to him. Yeah. You know, yeah. go ahead. Just the one thing, on the WhatsApp this week, and up to yesterday, there was a lot of, not a lot, but there was, there, there was dissension among us or debate. Some people were saying, Tim, you shouldn't be going ahead with this. Um, it's bad for PR and everything like that. The list isn't complete yet. At this stage, when I saw Tim's reply, the only PR that mattered was the poll last May. Mm -hmm. At this stage, the media is so rotten and corrupt and everything else that we're not going to, you know, to be trying to half get in with them and half look this and half look that. At the end of the day, what was today about? It's about saving babies. You know, when you really think about it and think about the media and think about this and everything else, and sometimes, yeah, it was like, it's like starting a business and I remember hearing a, a business advisor saying, you'll never be ready. You'll never be ready. You won't have your right email address. You won't have insurance. You won't have a website. You won't have if this. If you keep waiting, you know what I mean. Like next, never, yeah. You just have to step out. Yeah. So today was just about yeah. doing it at the same time as everyone else. So you make it look crucial. Like, I have, is, from you, my perspective, I'm just telling you, as an American coming here with basically this, you've heard my message. Is don't just you got to be you got to get spiritually strong. You've got to you know keep going forward, and you can't give up. And every minute, every second it's here, you're getting used to it. So you can't stop. Hold on. But what I, but what I was trying to what I, I I saw that from my perspective as a pretty strong activist myself. Great idea. The whole nation. I mean, it, to me, what, uh, I'm sorry, sir, what is your name? Fenton Power. And you're talking about the cleverness of Simon Harris with having the GPs have, like, make some... Well, he, 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 refused, he refused to meet them and negotiate them. Well, well what, what, related to what you're saying, though, about the clever work of the devil, to have kind of a forcing of adding to their list of duties that they have to refer to for abortions. Yeah. As the first channel for women seeking abortions to go through before the three day cooling off period, they call it, and all that, and verifying if they're actually above or under nine weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. The, um, the, other, the other thing is, like my friend Lucy, I just was with yesterday, she was saying the insidious side of this, setting it up in all these maternity hospitals, and, and so many very small villages and the entire octopus mm. arms of so many little tiny pieces and crevices of Ireland plus the doctoring medical community is being forced to participate even if they're trying not to mm. in some way. And like you're saying, like the, do the, the Judas doctors may be in the same building as the, the decent mm. doctors. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like this. Yeah. So, that, so in the same that's a nasty, horrible tactic. Yes. Yes. So you got to hit hard back. Yeah. That's, to me, that, that was a, I read this message from, um, I think, Helena about this thing. On, I was reading it on Friday at like 5 p.m. that there's a, a national, everybody go at 11 o'clock and stand everywhere in Ireland. And I'm like, holy Toledo, this is fabulous. This is hitting hard back. Yeah. And I'm, I, I, I just, I'm trying to say, as I've, I'm not trying to, Diminish to be ladylike and gentlemanly like. I'm saying you have to still be hardcore. Mm -hmm. Because this is diabolical evil. And it's part of what some of the people on my video are, are saying. Mm -hmm. My husband is very clear. He's 
in there. This is diabolical. Now, I know that those poor little children are probably going a little AWOL over there, and I know that maybe you need to use the ladies' room and the men's room and get, a, somebody was setting up maybe a little bit to drink. So why don't we take a break? I'm sorry if we keep, like, going on and on and on, but we shouldn't take a break. And I want you guys to see this video, because I think it'll encourage you again. It's only 15 minutes. Yeah, John. John. Yeah, okay. that place was closed down? That's correct. Do you think that the um, civil disobedience had a role to play in that? Well, it certainly did because the, uh, the police uh, from that point on uh, caused such a disturbance inside the abortion clinic that the owner decided if he had to close it down. At that time, we probably spent like a, two days in prison. Uh, there were a great number of people and it was really um, really 
put a lot of pressure on the prison, on the prison system. And you, as a parent, had these young, you know, young people come, you know, now living in a world with abortion. Yeah. And is that a large motivator? Of, I mean, is that why you got involved? The Catholic faith. Okay. As soon as we heard that abortion was made legal and we knew that it was killing, we decided to do something. Well, uh, thou shalt not murder probably was the first thing that comes into my mind. And obviously, you know, who said that. She invited me to come to a talk at the local Catholic Church of a guy who had been involved in direct action. So I heard the talk and the man was saying, uh, uh, if you were about to be killed, you were about to be killed, would you want somebody to hold a sign and protest your death? Would you want somebody to write letters to your congressman about protesting your death? Would you want somebody to actually try to stop you from being killed? And obviously the logic is you want somebody to try to stop you from being killed. Would I have done that by myself? Probably not. But because there were a lot of other people who prayerfully determined that had to stand between the abortionists and the baby. Uh, I cared because that's my daughter. Oh. There's two reasons. One, um, women deserve better than abortion. I think that it's much more um, fitting to the dignity of the woman to be given the resources to become a mother rather than kill her child because she's being told you can't pursue your dreams if you have a child. Like, I feel like it's way more empowering for women to hear, like, you can do this, rather than, you can't do this, you have to give up, you know? And the other reason is because um, the unborn child, no matter how small, is a person, and they deserve the right to life, and we need to defend them because they don't have the most to defend themselves. When we uh, discovered that it was, in fact, an active weekly abortion clinic, we said, That's, that is where we have to be. Yeah, on every day that we can yeah. when they're open. We've met through the pro-life movement and you have uh, seven children and some of your children were have stood with you in prayer. Yeah, yeah all of them yeah. at different times. Yeah. So it becomes a, a family affair and everyone supports each other. And you make family you make friends that are like family. That's right. Yeah. Describe what we you would do like when you're inside. Well, we to sit, in, sit down in the hall and pray. Say nothing, uh, except uh, situate yourself between the people that were there, or head for a room that was empty and and occupy a room. That's all there was to it. Right. Sit down, kneel down, and pray. I was one of the people that occupied one of the killing rooms for quite a while. We the That's room, my husband. Police eventually bashed down the door and got us out of there. When I, you know, became more conscious of what was going on in the country first and now around the world, yeah. that we were, we had reclassified babies uh, as they did in Germany with Jews and <clears throat> gypsies and any, any and all dissenters. Yeah. Uh, as they did in China as they did in Africa with, uh, I forget his name, but Ho Chi Minh, certainly in China, I believe they were, we were doing the very same thing. That's how we justified sl slavery, was we, we reclassified people or humans into something less than what God said we are. I'm here because you can't sit by while innocent people are being slaughtered That's my every son. day. Oh, here yeah. they only slaughter them, I think, on Fridays. Wednesdays, but you used to be Tuesdays. Just sit by and do nothing. I'm doing what I can do, which is stand outside and witness to what's going on. They're praying and interceding for the woman that they will receive the support they need to um, raise children and the grace to spare their children from this evil, and and that they will realize that. They aren't defined by their mistakes. That they can, there's always room for redemption. There's always an opportunity for God's mercy. And he may have 
fact, use these children to bring the bell. Um, they're flourishing and not their detriment. First thing we did was go down to pray the rosary at Crozier Chester. Uh, which is in Delaware. But also yeah. taking part in the March for Life as right. early as we could get into it. Did you encounter, that it's always in late January, on the 22nd of January, did you encounter snow? Lots of times. Yeah. Over 40 years? Yeah. That's my favorite. Yeah. It didn't, didn't keep <laughs> wow. you from going. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's something that you have to do. There's a way, there's a call to public witness in this event because of what happened in our country, and you have to do it. It's a conscience thing. You can step between the abortionist life and the mother and the baby. Try to convince the baby, the mother not to uh, kill their child. But even if you can't convince the mother, you're still a witness to the sanctity of that child's life by being willing to lay down your life. We're here to be the voice for the voiceless and to protect life and to uphold the dignity of women but also, I think it's especially important for young people to be coming out here because this is the world we've been given and we're the next generation and this is our problem and we need to stand up for it, for the truth. And again, to be there for the babies who cannot defend themselves and the mothers who need support and just need comfort and truth right now. Yeah. So
Oaks pop to it through the through the grassroots movement, leading them to the truth. And once they start seeing the pictures of what happens in an abortion, it comes to an end. God bless the Irish. When I got involved uh, in rescue, a wise Irish Columbian father who was over here as a missionary said to me, Walter, you are now directly confronting the evil one, Satan, by being involved in the pro-life movement. I strongly suggest that you go to daily mass and go to monthly confession and develop a prayer life with the rosary. And I've done that. And I'm recommending you do the same because you are definitely fighting the diabolical when you are fighting abortion. It's not just a philosophical difference. You are fighting the diabolical. And the diabolical uses all kinds of tricks to deceive people. And he'll definitely tempt you. God bless you. Thank you.